Good morning, Virginia. This is WGFW 88.7 on the FM dial, Drake's Branch, Virginia. This is Storytime, brought to you by Safe Haven Ministries. I am your host, Brother D. As always, let us begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our many blessings. Any day that we wake up, it is a blessing. Father, we ask you to be with those that are traveling today. Please keep them safe. Father, open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes as we bring forth today's story. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Duh, Brother D, what are we going to do today? Uh, what are we going to do today? Dog, would you calm down? Quit swinging that tail all over the place. I told you what we were going to do today. Duh, you know me. I get so excited. We on the radio. Dog, calm down. Duh, are we going to have another installment from Pastor Brian? That's right, dog. We're going to be doing chapter 5 in the story that Pastor Brian has been giving to us and everything. But we're going to start with one of our stories, and it's called The Life of a Pond. Duh, what do you mean, Life of a Pond, Brother D? Well, you stop and think about it, dog. Didn't you know that the pond has, a pond has a lifespan? Duh, no, it don't. Yes, it does, dog. A pond has a lifespan. You can actually watch the birth, development, and death of a pond in one lifetime. Duh, no. Yes, dog, you can. I have actually seen it. And you see, when a pond is first established, when it's dug or however it ends up being made, certain plants begin to grow along its shores and later on the bottom. Now, as it is filled by small nearby streams, or a watershed as the pond on our family farm was built and everything to catch the runoff from down a hill and everything. Seeds and more plant life are basically introduced into that pond. Now, as birds begin to visit the pond and everything, they drop other types of seeds and some insects and different kinds of eggs which cling to their legs and feet while the birds visited other ponds. Now, as sediment gradually builds up, the pond has, gets filled in in the spaces between the particles of sand. And the pond becomes shallower, and then its boundaries start to shrink. Sediment also starts to suffocate certain types of animal life in their eggs. Thus, the environment of the pond begins to change. Now, in its prime, a pond supports many types of birds, fish, plants, and insects. Duh, where did the fish come from? Well, that's just it, though. In a lot of ponds, as they're made, they're stocked and everything. We did that when we built the pond on our old family farm years ago. But you see, there are distinct zones of vegetation along the shoreline on a pond, varying from young trees and shrubs in the outer zone to plants that are rooted in the bottom of the pond. The thing is, the accumulated sediment, the mosses, and the floating plants, they continue to make the pond grow smaller and even shallower, as it shrinks, the variety of plant and animal life decreases as well, and the bottom becomes thick with muck, and floating plants soon cover the surface. Now, you see the turtles, they'll leave the pond and go searching for a new pond because the water is getting smaller and little, littler space and everything, and the fish soon begin to disappear because what little water there is doesn't have enough oxygen to support their life. You see, the pond will eventually become marshy with very little open water. And when the few remaining puddles dry up, the marsh is basically replaced by the advancing trees and shrubs. And then the old pond will be gone unless man scoops, you know, scoops the pond out and everything and, keep, you know, basically dredges the pond and everything and keeps it so that, you know, it's goes back to the original stage when it first started and everything, and then it can start out all over again. But if that doesn't happen, these ponds will eventually just disappear. Now, every pond you see is at some stage of its lifetime, and if it's kept dredged out, it will continue to live. Otherwise, it will die. You see, the muck on the bottom gets, grows thicker and thicker, choking the water life and everything. Now, if left undent the life, you know, well, I should say, a, our lives, if left unattended, become like the pond, shower and shower and everything. And 
the fresh water, you know, becomes stagnant in an unattended pond. And basically in our lives, thoughts and actions can stagnate if we don't continue to renew our minds in God's Word and in Jesus Christ. Duh, I never thought about that, Brother D. I got, I got a verse that goes with that. It says, it comes from Psalms 51, verse 10, and everything. And it says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew us a steadfast spirit within me. That's right, dog. And you know something? That's the thing. We have to basically go forward. You can't sit still or you will stagnate. And you can only go forward if you really... Truly study God's word and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Otherwise, you'll be like that pond. Eventually, all that muck is going to fill in and it'll suffocate the life right out of you. I never thought about that. But you know what it is now, don't you, Brother D? That's right, dog. It's time for Chapter 5, A Strange Tug of War in the Story that Pastor Brian Has Started. George woke to the cheerful sounds of the early morning forest. Birds sang, small animals rattled the underbrush, and leaves rustled in the tops of the tall trees. But he didn't feel very cheerful himself. Tears clouded his eyes as he watched the Indians tie loads to their shaggy ponies. Others fixed breakfast over a fire. He knew that in a few minutes they would be on their way again, going farther and farther from his home settlement. It seemed now that Pog couldn't possibly find him. Then he heard Robert stir, and he quickly dried his eyes with the back of his hands. Robert must not see him cry. You awake, Robert? George tried to sound cheerful, but Robert only moaned. George turned and saw that his friend looked wild-eyed and was crying softly. Could this be the same boy who had started gaily up the hill with him only yesterday? Robert's cries came louder and louder. Hearing this, two Indians came near, waving their tomahawks. They shouted fiercely at Robert, who only cried louder. George's heart stood still. Would these savages kill Robert right before his eyes? Robert, sit up and be quiet, George said softly. Then they'll leave you alone. George's calmness seemed to help Robert, for he sat up then and tried to stop crying. The Indians brought each of them corn mixed with venison. It tasted good to George. But again, Robert ate only a few mouthfuls. The same Indians who had led their pony the day before now appeared and led them to the area where the ponies were tethered. Bundles already packed on their backs. The Indians lifted Robert onto a pony's back and tied him on tightly. He seemed to take special pleasure in yanking hard on the straps around Robert's ankles. Blood oozed out from under the straps. George's face turned red, and he thought fast. Quickly, he tore two pockets from his buckskin coat, shoving them into the Indian's hand. He pointed towards the cruel straps. Put them under the straps, he said excitedly. Put them under. George doubted that the Indian could understand his words. Yet he seemed to understand the meaning. He slowly untied Robert's straps and retied them, putting the pockets between the straps and the bruised ankles. Like yesterday, the Indians hide the pony to his own. Then, much to George's surprise, he called for another pony. A young Indian brave brought up a sleek brown and white pony, and the other Indian motioned for George to climb on. The brave placed the reins in George's hands, and the two Indians walked away. Why, they're not even going to tie me today, George thought. They're going to let me guide my own pony. I guess Pa's advice was good after all. It pays to act brave, even when you're scared almost to death. At that very thought, George even managed to grin. After a few days on the trail, George picked up a few words of the Indian language. 
Whenever he tried using them, the Indians looked surprised but pleased. Remembering Pa's advice, he kept a careful watch on everything and began to learn the Indian customs. He discovered that the more he cooperated with the Indians, the better they treated him. One morning, the Indian warrior who watched after the boys waved his arm to catch George's attention and beckoned for George to follow him. George had just wakened and still felt sleepy-eyed, but he obediently followed. What could the big warrior want now? Was he taking George to the forest to get rid of him there? George followed the Indian to a large clearing where the Indian ponies roamed. Then the Indian swept his arm towards the ponies. Come, we get ponies, he said. George sighed with, with relief. The Indian only wanted George to help him round up the ponies. What fun he had now with the Indian, racing after the ponies and leading them back to camp. For the first time in days, George really felt like laughing. He and the Indian laughed together. When they had caught all the ponies, George was out of breath, but the Indian didn't seem tired at all. He strode quickly to camp, and George had to run to keep up with him. Once at camp, another Indian brought George his breakfast, a serving twice as big as they had ever given him before. Maybe these Indians aren't so bad after all, George thought, as he hungrily slurped up his breakfast. So long as I'm going to be with them, I may as well enjoy it as much as possible, at least until I can escape. And that was George's biggest ambition, to escape to some settlement or town and get some men to help rescue Robert. Then he and Robert would finish their way home. He hoped that if he cooperated with the Indians, they would give him enough freedom that he could make a run for it when the chance came. Now George purposefully watched for chances to help his captors. Every morning, after helping his warrior friends friend round up the ponies, he would help load them with the Indians' bundles. George wondered what was in them. At night, he helped unload the bundles. George even tried his hand at fixing Indian stew, carefully scraping corn from the cob and cutting hard venison into small chunks to mix with the corn. He pulled up some wild onions he had found in the forest and mixed them in the stew, too. The Indians smacked their lips with pleasure. George also hoped that by cooperating, he could make up for the way Robert acted. For Robert certainly didn't cooperate. He remained tearful and silent. He seemed to know only that the Indians took him further and further from home. When they told him to do something, he just drooped his head and stood still. When they untied his cords at night, he immediately fell to the ground. The Indians had to tie Robert to his pony while they rode to keep him from falling off. And every day they seemed to become more displeased with him, treating him roughly and shouting fierce commands that he paid no attention to. After about three weeks of hard, steady riding from sunup until long after sundown, the little party reached a large Indian camp situated behind a high hill. Many wigwams crowded together on the grassy plain. George guessed there must be more than a hundred of them. The Indians made their wigwams from animal hides stretched over poles. They had a rounded top and a big flap served as a door. As George watched, Dozens of squaws and children poured out of the wigwams to greet the returning party, and almost as many dogs woke up from afternoon naps to run after the horses and bark their greeting. George and Robert seemed to have been forgotten in the excitement, but not for long. Once the warriors had greeted their families again, the boys discovered that they were the center of attention, the most valuable prize of the raid.
Old squaws reached out hands to touch their pale skin. Little children stared curiously, and dogs growled suspiciously. George had never felt more uncomfortable, but he didn't know how to avoid their stares, because he and Robert had not been given a place to go. After walking around the camp for about an hour, George caught sight of his warrior friend, whose name he had discovered was Wunsack, coming toward him. Behind him came Robert, looking wide-eyed and fearful as usual. You come with me, Wunsack said in his own language, and George understood. He wants us to follow him, George said to Robert. They followed Wunsack to a wigwam on the edge of the clearing at the center of the camp. My home, you stay here with Squaw and Papoose, Wunsack said again in his own language. He says we're going to live with, with him and his family, Robert, George explained. Sometimes George surprised himself at how quickly he was learning to understand the strange Indian words. After the first few days, the Indians paid little attention to the two pale-faced boys. George helped Wonsack when he could, but most often Wonsack hunted animals for food with the other braves. George spent most of his time walking quietly through the village, wishing with all his heart to escape. Often he would hunt up Robert and try to cheer him up. He almost, he almost always could find Robert sitting in the shade of some uh, by the side of one sex wigwam. Look, Robert, I brought you a dish of stew one of the squaws gave me. Robert had lost much weight, and George worried that he'd starve to death. I don't want it, George. I'm not hungry. Not hungry? Well, you haven't eaten all day, and you hardly ate yesterday. I can't eat that dirty food, George. It tastes awful. I don't know how you can eat it. It's not so good as my ma is cooking, but... Still, it ain't too bad. In fact, I sort of like it. Come on, try a little. You've got to get strong so we can run hard when we have a chance to escape. Robert pushed George, George's hand away and began to sob. I don't want it. Well, then, how about taking a walk around the camp with me? There's a stream on the other side with cool water. Maybe you'll feel hungry when we get back. I'm too tired, George. Please just let me be. And Robert lay down again in the shade of the wigwam. George just shook his head and walked away. He'd go to the stream by himself. One night, about a week after they had settled in the big camp, George was awakened by the noise of many voices and hoarse Indian laughter. George had gone to sleep that night, and now he crept silently to the, wig, the wigwam and saw many Indian men gathered at the center of the camp. One sat so close, George could almost reach out and touch him. A few minutes, all the laughing stopped, and the Indians began what George thought must be a serious powwow. George listened closely to what they said, but... He couldn't make it make out more than a few words. They talked too fast for him to understand. After about an hour of talking, several of the Braves left and soon returned dragging large bundles that looked like the ones George had helped tie on the ponies so often before reaching camp. Then one tall Indian slowly stood up and carefully emptied a bundle on the ground. What George saw made his heart sink. Tumbled on the ground were ornaments and household tools that could have come only from settlers' homes. This must be what they took from my settlement, George thought. That's what I so carefully tied on the ponies. Now the Indians emptied more of the bundles, and George caught sight of 
of many things he recognized as his mother's. Her blue stoneware pitcher from which he had often poured cold buttermilk, copper kettles, her shell trimmed handkerchief box, a red garnet brooch, and piles and piles of blankets, quilts, and linens she had worked so hard to make. George wanted to scream out in despair, but he didn't dare. He just sat tensely in the shadows, choking back big sobs. Before George had time to do anything more, a sturdy old Indian, his skin brown and dried by the sun, quickly jumped up and barked a short command. George recognized him as the Indian leader. Immediately, Braves began separating the stolen goods into two heaps. They laid his mother's blankets and linens in a third heap. Then the old Indian took a long stick, walked to the edge of the clearing, and started back, drawing a line on the ground through the center of the circle of Indians. Through us, through to a smaller center clearing, which the Indians sat around, and on the other side of the circle of Indians. The Indians were now divided down the center, half on one side of the line and half on the other with a line through the empty center clearing. The old Indian returned to the center and pointed to two strong braves, one from each side, and they came forward. The old Indian tied their right hands together with buckskin thongs, and the braves stepped to the center line, one on each side. Now each began pulling in his own direction with all of his strength, George realized that they were trying to pull each other over the line. Something like a tug-of-war, he thought. George leaned forward, eager to see the outcome. Shadows from the flickering fire danced on the dark, muscular bodies of the struggling braves. Back and forth they moved, tugging and straining, heavy, corded muscles rippling in the backs and arms. George decided the old Indian had chosen the Braves wisely. They seemed evenly matched. Suddenly, the Indian on the left stretched out his foot, kicking the other from behind. The surprised Indian fell slightly forward, then regained his balance and suddenly jerked backwards. Now he stretched out his leg too, as if to kick, but quickly brought it back, giving another sudden jerk in his direction. His opponent started forward, and it seemed as if the other might win. The watching Indians, until now, silent, cheered and screamed, calling encouragement to one another or, or the other brave. After just a few minutes, the braves slowed down, seemed to be tired. Then with one last mighty burst of energy, one Indian dragged the other across the line. It was all over. The brave on the left had won, and the other Indians cheered loudly. The defeated Indian retook his place in the crowds, while the winner stood tall in the center clearing. His face unmoved, but his arms folded proudly across his broad, heaving chest. George felt a surge of dislike for this tall, proud Indian. Whatever he had won, George suspected it belonged to Ma. Then the old Indian stepped forward again and held up his hands for silence. He pointed to a brave from the side whose warrior had lost the tug of war and said a few words. The brave immediately walked to the pile of Ma's blankets and dumped them onto the pile of housewares heaped on the winter's side. So that's what the tug-of-war was about, George thought. It was a contest to see who would win the blankets. Now the Indians were dividing the stolen goods among themselves. George thought he would cry when he saw one Indian holding Ma's fine clock and curiously turning the hands around and around.
Ain't that your ma's clock? A voice whispered behind George. George jumped. It was Robert. He had thought Robert was, was asleep. How long have you been watching? George asked. All the cheering woke me up. But I feel sick. I mean, really sick. I guess I'll go back to sleep. George noticed that Robert could hardly walk. George continued to watch the Indians and was surprised to see that none of them seemed dissatisfied over the results of the contest. Instead, they all sat down again and began a weird chant with words that George had never heard before. A brave carried a big drum to the center of the circle and began beating it in a steady rhythm. The drum had been made from a hollow section of a log with a buckskin stretched tightly across it. George had seen this drum before, and he knew the drumsticks were made of buckskin too. They were filled with hair and fastened, fastened to sticks. George guessed the sticks had to be about eight inches long. Now three more braves took their places around the drum, and they also began beating it. The chanting came louder and faster. Still sitting in the shadows of the wigwam door flap, George watched with open mouth. He couldn't help thinking of the happy times he had spent with his family singing songs around the fire. Some songs of the New World and many songs his grandparents had brought from Germany. All at once, as if by some given signal, several warriors jumped into the middle of the circle and began a strange dance. Up and down they bent, all the while turning in circles, leaping into the air and setting up loud, monotonous howl. Soon several more braves jumped into the circle, then more and more until dancing braves filled the whole clearing, their wild leaping forms making tall, flickering shadows in the flyer flight. After many minutes of watching, George decided he had seen enough and returned to his blanket to sleep. But the dancing figures seemed to leap at him in the darkness, not in all the weeks since he had been stolen from home had he felt so unhappy. The howling, chanting voices outside the wigwam kept reminding him that never could he enjoy this strange, savage life. Never could he accept it. Somehow he must find his way home. If not this month, then next month. If not this year, then next year. He didn't know when he'd get his chance. He only felt certain it would come. George Wood. Duh, we thank Pastor Brian for having these stories set up for us and all. Duh, Brother D, you need to look at the time. That's right, dog. Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for our many blessings. We are grateful for all that you've given us this day. We ask you be with those that are traveling. Father, we especially ask that you be with our doctors, our nurses, our EMTs, our firefighters, our law enforcement, all the first responders who keep us safe. Father, we especially ask that you be with our military who protect us so that we may worship you as we see fit. Be with our families because our families also serve because they have to endure while their loved ones are out protecting us. Father, all this we are grateful for in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, folks, if you like what you hear on the radio, you can call us at 434-390-5981. That, that's 434-390-5981. That's right, folks. Or you can email us at emtx3xl at gmail.com. Once again, folks, we remind everybody, WGFW is a Christian radio station and can always use your support. There's no advertisements on this radio station. So please remember, give generously. You can contact us, with, get the information you need to send your donations. Also, we'd like to thank Safe Haven Ministries for sponsoring Storytime. 
Safe Haven Ministries is an independent Christian ministry. Once again, folks, this is WGFW, Drake's Branch, Virginia, 88.7 on your FM dial. We return you to the regular broadcast. Duh, may your week be blessed.